Good afternoon, I'm Gail Amon. Now, if I told you to imagine a country where the rate of maternal death has more than doubled in the past 20 years, that nearly 60,000 women die each year from complications related to pregnancy, and that in some parts of the country, the rate of the maternal death is on par with Sub-Saharan Africa, I imagine most of you would not think we are in the United States. And yet we are. Maternal mortality has been called a human rights crisis in the U.S. And here to discuss that crisis and what we do about it is an incredible panel filled with the, really the knowledge that I think is the only answer to bringing down those incredible statistics. Monica Simpson is the executive director of Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. And Dr. Priya Agarwal is, a, is an OBGYN and executive director of Merck for Mothers. And they are really leading the way in reducing maternal mortality, both here in the U.S. and on a global scale. And Elise Turner is an associate professor at Belhaven University who's worked for over 30 years as a certified nurse midwife in Mississippi. And she has incredible firsthand knowledge of working in some of the toughest parts of the U.S. when it comes to saving women's lives during childbirth. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Agrawal, let's first talk about the problem. The U.S. is the only industrialized nation in which the number of women who die from childbirth is actually on the rise. That, it's an incredible statistic when you think about that. Did that surprise you? I mean, we spend over $80 billion on these issues, and yet the numbers are going in absolutely the wrong direction. I think it's four times the U.K. in terms of maternal mortality. What is going on? Yeah. When we launched Merck for Mothers, which is Merck's $500 million 10-year commitment to reducing maternal mortality globally, we weren't expecting to be working in the U.S. We're working in 30 other countries where you'd expect us to be, low- and middle-income countries. Was it part of your original plan to work in the U.S.? No. no. We heard the data. In fact, we got the data from many of these states, and we realized that we had to do something. But then we started trying to figure out what is going on. Why is this happening? And we realized that the U.S. maternal health community doesn't know exactly why. Mm. Despite the fact that you've heard panel after panel at the Women in the World yep. say mothers are important, yeah. or mothers were the inspiration, or mothers for yeah. peace and climate change, actually there's been some complacency. What we do know is we know that there are three leading causes. Mm. One is postpartum hemorrhage, so that's bleeding in childbirth, preeclampsia, so high blood pressure during pregnancy and childbirth, mm. and the fact that women are entering pregnancy sicker. Mm. So this year, mm. one out of five women who become pregnant will be obese, but there's diabetes and hypertension. And then, of course, the biggest barrier, which you're actually dealing with today by bringing us together, is there's really low awareness, and the silence around this issue is allowing the complacency to continue. Well, and the silence is aided by a lack of data, right? I mean, U.S. hospitals are not even required to record that. Can you tell me about... Right. So there are three areas of absolute need that we need to address immediately. Mm -hmm. One is that maternal deaths aren't even counted in a reliable way in every state in this country. And it's actually supposed to be a never event, like an airplane accident. You're supposed to definitely count them mm -hmm. uh, and then review them so you can prevent them in the future. The second area is, unlike with a heart attack, where we all know, as a member of a healthcare team, what to do, there's no code blue or standard protocol for the obstetric killers. And the third area is that pre-existing conditions that I told you about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's incredible that the records don't even mm. exist, right? Because how can you solve the problem if you don't understand its scope? Right. Uh, Elise, you know, a maternal near miss can happen to any woman. This is not something that knows barrier or wealth or education, you know, it, it, those kinds of walls. Explain to us what that is. A near miss is when a woman has a complication, as you spoke of, that could result in death, but through intervention or luck, sometimes just luck, the woman didn't die. Uh, some examples, a, a typical example, and I find that most of the near misses that I've seen with patients occur because providers don't listen to women. Have you ever experienced a doctor or a hospital person who didn't listen to you when you had a problem? <laughs> Same thing applies here. A mom comes to the hospital and says, I, I don't feel right, my, my tummy feels funny, the baby doesn't feel right, they'll check her out. Uh, they sent the patient home, 
She was about 32 weeks, you know, in the last part of her pregnancy. Um, but she, when she left, the last thing she said was, I just don't feel right. Something, something's not right. And they, they reassured her, you're fine, you're fine. You're just a nervous Nellie. Go home. <laughs> well, she went home and she delivered a preterm baby at home by herself. Then she began to hemorrhage. It was only because a neighbor had stopped by to check on her that she was found and an ambulance called to save her life. So again, we have to listen yep. to our patients. So it's also women speaking up, right? And helping giving women the tools it, to it use is. their own voice. It is. All of us are patients and we have to be consumers of health care, just like you're consumers of plumbing or electrical work. You've got to, to be vocal about what you need. And if you're not satisfied, if you're still not feeling the way you feel safe or confident, you need to raise a ruckus. Well, Can I just add something to that, though? Because it's not just about the woman having information, because often the woman is sometimes feeling disempowered or right. sick. And you saw in the video, and it, you know, especially an audience that's got women and men, actually the husband and the partner and the family members sure. play a crucial role yes. in recognizing the warning signs. What are those? So, for example, you know, with um, preeclampsia, mm -hmm. there are warning signs often the woman doesn't notice. She's like, well, I'm getting fat or I'm looking <laughs> swollen. And actually her family member says, you know, I don't think you look right, that right. like, you've changed. But there's also things that women and their partners can do to prevent the complications. Mm -hmm. So one of the causes is pulmonary embolism. It's like the clot that you develop in your leg and goes up to your lung and is fatal. Actually, if you're pregnant, you're at higher risk of developing that. So if you go on a long haul journey, which really is four hours or more, you should be hydrating, moving, and talking to your healthcare provider about low-dose aspirin. So I, I think it's about ensuring that the woman and her family is empowered, because here, knowledge is power. Yeah. Right. Monica, mother, the uh, mother house is part of Sister Song, right? Yes. And women can come and share their stories. Yes. And I think part of this is there's so much silence right. around this, that there is a huge power in actually gathering those stories. Yeah. You know, can you tell us about Laurie, who was part of this group and yes. had pregnancy complications? Um, absolutely. So one of the things that we did at Sister Song, we did a report in collaboration with the Center for Reproductive Rights. where We wanted to get the stories on the ground from women being impacted by this issue. And so we did focus groups in Atlanta and Mississippi where we see some of the highest um, rates of maternal mortality. And Lori was one of our participants in Mississippi. Um, and she was a young mother. She had had twins at 16 and so she was pregnant again. Um, and she went to the doctor because she wasn't feeling well. She was bleeding. And she's like, I think I may be having a miscarriage. She actually knew that herself, even at the age of 18, when she was pregnant for this pregnancy. And the doctor sent her home. You're fine. Oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And so she actually ended up, when she was at home, hemorrhaging, right? Her, her family had to take her back to the doctor, and she actually did have a miscarriage. Lori could have lost her life, yeah. right? And this all could have been prevented, um, but she almost nearly lost her life in this situation. Well, I mean, that goes to Dr. Agarwal's point. You know, if this is so preventable, why don't we know more about it? Why aren't we talking more about it? And what do we do? Yeah, I think it's actually shocking considering, you know, motherhood is so important. And I think there's some specifics about maternal mortality and morbidity. One is that when a mother dies, the protagonist, the biggest advocate, her voice has been extinguished. Mm -hmm. What does she leave behind? A newborn that doesn't have a voice yet, mm -hmm. and a husband or a partner who is stunned into silence because they're now grieving and looking after mm -hmm. a newborn. But this issue of a near miss that you talk about, you would imagine those women Mm -hmm. would be the best advocates for this. Absolutely. But actually what you'll notice, and you've had these conversations, women will talk about their long labor. I had a C-section when I wanted a normal delivery. I had a normal delivery when I wanted a C-section. But when things really go wrong, mm -hmm. when they experience a near miss, because we're not talking about it, women blame themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So as we've been uncovering these stories, and as you have, right. I've just realized there's a huge secret society out there, not a secret society that women want to be part of, not a secret society that women even know they're a member of. Mm -hmm. And it's a double tragedy because once they start talking, that's where the healing yeah. process starts. 
but it's also a missed opportunity if they don't talk about it because information could save another woman's life. But it's about them being asked, right? Because what we found when we did this report and we dug deep into these communities was that women want to share these stories. They actually want to talk about these issues. When we were sitting in these circles, they were like, thank you for coming and asking us the question. So this doesn't have to fall on the, in the laps of like nonprofit organizations like my own, but it's about how are we creating these spaces with our healthcare care providers, you know, in, our, in other ways that we can actually help women share their stories so that we can start to break this issue down. And it doesn't have to be formal. I, you know, I say Absolutely to all of not. you, use your voice, <laughs> right, start yeah. a conversation that matters. Actually, I was just sitting in the audience, one woman on the right was saying, oh yeah, labor, I had two children, absolutely <gasps> fine, no problem. I'm like, really? And then the woman on my other side was like, actually, I yeah. nearly died, and if it right. hadn't been for good health care. Right. And I was like, wow, I wonder if she's ever spoken to anyone about that. Right. Well, and it means so many times none of us speak about that, right? Because it's yeah. our fault, as, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, on the area of shocking statistics, yeah. so African-American women are four times as likely, and I have to keep looking at my notes because that number is still stunning to me by the 50th time I read it, four times as likely to die of pregnancy-related complications. Yes. What are the most significant barriers facing women who are trying to get the care they need? Right. Some of the, well, I think the first barrier is access, right? And so we, our report really focused on the South. We wanted to really dig into the part of the country where we see the most disparities, right? And so the first issue that we came up with was access. Yeah. And so the South overwhelmingly did not want to expand Medicaid, not making it possible for hundreds of thousands of women to be able to take care of themselves and their families. So if we have lack of access, then we have higher maternal mortality. The other issue was still about the fact, especially as we were looking at the South, was that racial discrimination and age discrimination, many other discriminations, right, really played, an, played a role yeah. in these women's experiences, um, prenatal, postnatal, um, and that is serious. And, and I, I really feel like if we don't address that as a core issue, then yeah. we're going to continue to see rising rates of maternal yeah. mortality. Well, and on the issue of access, at least, you know, not one hospital in Mississippi adheres to all care standards. Right. How do you address the challenge of getting the care women need in a hospital setting where you think you would be the most safe? Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult issue. We live in a, a profit-driven society as far as many of our medical care outlets are arranged. And so you have to approach matters uh, from an economic standpoint. And we know that good care is actually cost-efficient care. So I think we have to be savvy and talk to business leaders about how good care, care that goes by national standards, international standards of what we know works. We've got to push the care out to the people. We've been centralizing our medical care for years in the United States. We're taking care away from small communities. People that have to drive an hour and a half yeah. to have a baby, we have babies born on the side of the road in Mississippi all the time because couldn't make it to the hospital. So, you know, we need to use models that have been successful in other areas such as health houses, local health huts, Think about how fire stations are arranged. Right. Think how all, every community has a little fire station, volunteer fire department. What if you had the same kind of structure for health houses or health mm. stations, okay? Which is more likely, your house to burn down or you to get sick? So I think that's a, right. that's a good model to use. Absolutely. And what is so amazing to me is I've covered a lot of maternal health issues in Afghanistan. I've gone to house to house visits yes. mm. and the issues are the same. Yeah, sure. That is Absolutely. shocking, right? And if you want to think about that issue, and, and you know, I know that you at least used to go into women's homes after they had delivered yes. mm -hmm. uh, babies in, in the Mississippi Delta. You know, what did you learn from the after delivery? I had, I had many experiences as a certified nurse midwife up in the Mississippi Delta, which is thought to be one of the poorest areas of our country. And the thing I learned, I would go out, a common type of visit would be to get in my car and go out to a woman's home because she could only stay in the hospital 24 hours because of the pay structure, so she, structure, so she was booted out to go home. Uh, one of the patients that touched my heart the most was a young mother who lived in a house trailer somebody had just dumped out in a cotton field. It wasn't hooked up to water. Uh, she had to go somewhere to get water. She had other small children there. Mm. But this woman loved her baby. And she had done everything she could to take the best care of her baby. But when she got home, she didn't realize that her milk wouldn't come in for a couple of days. She thought that what she was seeing, the watery colostrum, which is completely normal and very beneficial to the baby, was something wrong and she couldn't feed her baby. 
So she borrowed some formula powder from another woman, but didn't know how to dilute it correctly. So the baby got formula that was too strong for the baby, and again, caused kidney problems. Uh, again, all, totally preventable. Why are we not going out and visiting postpartum mothers, that visiting nurse service we used to have in the old days? Yeah, yeah. So I've got some good news for some Mississippi. I was just telling Elise okay. that, so we, um, we're sort of only three years old. We say we're at the end of our first trimester. But um, we're working in 16 states, um, covering about 25% of the deliveries yeah. in the US, so 1.1 million deliveries at three different levels, right? Making sure that the states count the deaths, review them, do something about it. We now have a standard protocol that's being instituted in all hospitals across those states, mm -hmm. as well as models of care to connect women who are, have pre-existing conditions mm -hmm via community health worker and cell phone technology. So someone from Mississippi, I'm trying to remember the leadership, just contacted our New York partner mm -hmm. and said, actually, could you bring these models and these protocols yeah. Yeah. to Mississippi? Right. So there's this wonderful pool model that's yeah. happening we want it. from your state <laughs> saying we want these programs. Right. So it's we're amazing. looking forward to partnering. Amazing. <laughs> and Lisa, what are the three basic questions that a woman can ask her health care provider. As, a, as an informed consumer, I think it's really important for you to take the lead in your care and some questions that will really help you get the meat of your visit with a care provider is, what is my main problem? What do I need to do about it? And then why is this important for me? And I think that me word is the one we've got to focus on because we can't do boilerplate medicine where one size fits nobody. We've got to individualize <laughs> care to you, your baby, your pregnancy. And then last, I think a fourth question that my experience has taught me is helpful for patients is, what should happen next? How many of us go home from the doctor's office and the next day are kind of like, oh, I'm not really sure what should happen next. So, so ask those pointed questions, write them down, and I think it will give you the confidence to get the good health care you need during pregnancy and just during other health problems or wellness. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a local problem that we often think of as global, and you went to the UN to yes, talk about did. these issues. You know, what are some of the things that you proposed at the United Nations to address maternal mortality in this country? Yeah, so with the report, it's called Reproductive Injustice, um, Racial and Gender Discrimination in U.S. Healthcare, right? And um, so we took this report before the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and we charged them to, first of all, address the fact that discrimination is still real in the United States of America and that it plays a role in our healthcare system. We also really put forth a serious charge around making sure that we expand healthcare services, including expanding Medicaid in the U.S. and raising that as an international issue because if we have folks who are not insured, if we have folks without access, then we continue to have the issues that we have. So those are some of the main points that we were lifting, but all of the recommendations that we put forth were received very, very well and we're now working to implement those. I mean, and it's kind of, I can see the image of you at the U.N. talking about the United <laughs> oh, <yeah>. States. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Agarwal, we have this national goal of reducing maternal death, and yet we are well short. I think five states have met that goal. You know, where are we now? And, you know, I know we were talking about some of the solutions, but are there solutions that you see that are working? Yeah, so actually, I think we've got some good news here. We feel like we're at a bit of a tipping point. You know, partners have been working in the field. We feel like we're just giving them wind in their sails and creating a platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we're sort of acting as a catalyst. As I said, the states are adopting this pregnancy checkbox. They're collecting the data. We're already seeing states implement recommendations. Uh, the states that are beginning to implement the protocols, it's great. Uh, bleeds and now not leading to transfusion and surgeries. Yeah. Um, and I think that with events like this, we can really increase awareness around this issue. So I think there's interest. The problem is the vision we have is that every woman in America yeah. should receive the right care at the right time and when she needs it. And we're far away from that. So, and we can't do it alone. We've got to work together. And I know I'm sort of sitting with two women, amazing women from the South. I need to remind the audience, this is an issue that affects all women. So I've had seven senior executives at Merck tell me their sister, niece, wife yeah. has suffered a near miss. That's not an access issue. Yeah. So I think, you know, we need to remember that this is a conversation that we need to have mm. uh, um, ev with everyone. So we're going to do one lightning round of solutions. For each one of you, can you give me one thing that people here in the U.S. can do? to get involved, raise awareness, or to learn about this issue and to make a difference in saving mothers' lives. Let's start with you, Lisa. 
listen to pregnant women, talk to pregnant women, love pregnant women. <laughs> <laughs> love pregnant women, I love it. I would say use your voice, use your social networks because you could potentially save a life. Whether it's your state legislator, your friend circle, start a conversation that matters because one child that doesn't get to know the mum that brought them into this world is one child too many. Thank you. Mm. And I would just, and this, we, we have a global sisterhood here. I think this is what this platform provides for us to see this in a global sisterhood in action. I think it's about continuing to feed that global sisterhood and to remain as connected as possible and to be the change, be the voice. You hear the information today, be the one to be able to tell the next person about this and we can continue, then we will see change really happen. Agreed. Yeah. 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 So you have it. Love expectant mothers, you know, feed the global sisterhood, focus on the tipping point. I mean, you've given us so much to really think about here today because this is an issue that affects every single person Everyone. in right. this room. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, Elise, Monica, you guys have been incredible and you've really helped us to understand an issue that I think a lot of us, certainly myself included, did not realize was so very pressing right here where we sit today. Um, if you have not already visited the Merck for Mothers Lounge located on the left side of the lobby, now is the time to do so because there is a fascinating three-question quiz. And three questions will give you one big solution that you can implement in making a difference for saving mothers' lives. Thank you so much to all of you Thanks for being here. Thanks, guys. <laughs>